I wanted to handle a question today, a very interesting question that came in a few days ago. Sunim, I hope you are well. Thank you so much for supporting our practice and for answering our questions. Now, I also have one question. There have already been a few times in my life that I was totally aware and clear, therefore completely involved in the present moment, usually after a shocking experience or after a retreat. Interesting. Shocking experience or retreat? <laughs> but it's true. That has a lot of truth in it. Although those episodes have completely changed the everyday relationship with my thoughts, thus a detached participation in the relationship with my surroundings, there are still situations when I get emotionally involved and I lose that clarity. Especially when it has to do with other people. Why? What happens? Why is it so difficult to keep clarity without social distancing? And although I've been practicing social distancing for many years now, I still feel like it's, you can run but you cannot hide. What a great expression. I mean, I know a lot more about myself, but it's difficult to apply it in the everyday life, especially in relationships with other people. This is a fantastic question and one that a lot of us can connect with. Um, it certainly resonates here uh, very deeply. Well, first one thing I can try to get out of the way um, or make clear if possible is there are already a few times in my life that I was totally aware and clear, especially after a shocking experience or after a retreat. That's a very, very important um, set of examples that the person brings up. Especially after a shocking experience or after a retreat. And I can answer the first part of that. Why a shocking experience and retreat? Because there is some applicability there. Um, and we know people who've experienced some extraordinary trauma, which is a shocking experience, and um, some really abrupt, unexpected experience can have extraordinarily detailed memory of it. And one of the reasons is when you have a shocking experience, people who've experienced trauma, the situation such as, I'm sorry, like a, a sexual trauma, a rape, or a, a mugging, or some sort of accident. Um, at that time, the brain, our, our whole mind to body is filled with cortisol and adrenaline, which kind of freezes, it causes the brain to freeze memory in place. That's why people who have experienced some kind of trauma can often recall in exquisite detail aspects of the experience, right down to the cologne the person was wearing, the aggressor was wearing, or the clothing, or what sound was happening outside the window, can have extraordinarily excruciating detail about that, because neurochemicals can freeze that experience in place, almost create a freeze frame vision or memory while it's happening. Okay, so I know one experience I'll talk about in some other situation where I was experienced in a very, uh, where I was involved in a very serious car accident uh, just a few years ago, very, very, very serious. I mean, I kind of should be dead right now, uh, but had no injury, and the car was more or less totaled. I wasn't driving. Um, and I have detail of that experience down to the millisecond while it was happening. It was a clarity which was almost something you would wish for again if it didn't have to be stimulated by and that's because these neurochemicals <clears throat> whatever someone out there can talk about the neuropharmacology of why these why in evolution we need to do this but we get this incredible clarity so that just to answer to knock off that part of the question why in a shocking experience or in a retreat there is stuff in evolutionary biology which supports 
the first part of your question. So that's beautiful. And after a retreat, well, yeah, that is pretty clear because the mind, the thinking, thinking slows down. We, we, we detach from auto-identification with thinking as it's appearing and being taken into these realms of past and present and fear and future and anxiety and doubt and being pulled. We're not in this swirl of thinking. So in a retreat, you start to see thinking appear and stay and disappear, and you have some view. And then that gives you clarity, as the questioner rightly has experienced, some clarity to see a perspective on mind, on life, whatever you want to call it, moment. You start to trust moment. You're not going after the whole dog chasing its tail dynamic of your normal mental functioning, which is a dysfunction, actually. Dogs don't live like that. Cats don't live like that. Birds don't live like that. We live like that. So that's why in retreat you get that clarity. <clears throat> thinking comes, thinking goes in your everyday life. You identify with it as it's happening. In fact, you wake up in a dream, from a dream, and that activity of thinking just carries you through the day in that sticky, 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 sticky identification with thoughts as they're randomly f flowing through your sewage pipe dream state become your reality. And then we'll start to predictate the limited options and more and more limited options for how you can react to arising situations in your life. So that's the unclarity that we take to be reality. Retreat, perspective, you get this clarity, you have more of range of choices. Now, why does that get so disturbed, the questioner asks, when dealing with other people? <clears throat> I started uh, Zen practice um, in, in a formal way, in the Cambridge Zen Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, while I was in graduate school. And we used to have these three-day retreats, um, three-day Yongming Yongjin retreats. And it was great, first time to be in a prolonged silence with other people, people who I lived with in the house. You know, we had a Zen center that was residential at the time. People would also come in from outside. But you lived together, you knew the people, you had had interactions with them during the week, but then when retreat came, everyone, by the extraordinary technology that Desantzny bequeathed to us, um, that he downloaded to our lives, uh, we could get into this incredible silence together while looking into the practice. Fantastic. Then, at the end of the retreat, the retreat would end on sun Sunday afternoon, bam! You know, there would be the circle park, you could make an offering about your experience, but beautifully built into that if you didn't have anything you felt like expressing or if it was kind of hard to express in words, you could just put your hands like that and go on. So the first couple times I did that because I wasn't really a public speaker kind of person anyway. I had all of these sorts of anxieties and, and fears and, and just somewhat the complications that the letter writer talks about. But then, bam, after the circle talk, there would be tea and cake and cookies and ice cream and the people in the retreat could, you know, some people were leaving and you could have a little bye-bye and talk and hang out. And I would, I grew terrified of that experience at the end of the retreat because people who I knew and, and who I liked and, and who I had spent time, I didn't like so much, is the, you know, the whole mix of, of personalities that can fill a family or a sangha, you know, you're bam, you're in the middle of it and you got to swim again after this incredible And the retreats weren't always completely clear mind, but there was enough sense of that dimension of clarity and such a longing to be there all the time, if I could only, that when that rule <clears throat> was set aside, the silence rule, and we had to go back into interaction. There was this, I would get energy up. I would feel my heart pounding a lot. I would get headaches. And of course, teachers 
in the retreat would often warn, be careful when you come out of this experience that you do it gradually, and if you don't feel like talking, take your time, take your space and all that. There were admonitions, but you got to learn it yourself. So I grew terrified and was really concerned. Why this difference? If this is, if Zen is everyday life, why does the retreat end and I can't deal with everyday life anymore? So this is in line with what the questioner is also experiencing. I had that very strongly for the first year of practice. And even, especially then when we did the 90-day retreats, oh my God, we'd get back to the temple or the, the silence would break and everyone, 90 days, hadn't really interacted socially. And I'd be like, oh, God, this and that, comes back and forth. And I would feel really sick and actually kind of depressed by it. There wasn't an it. I just would finally fall into a, not fall into a depression, but I would feel really sad. I would feel really like I longed to be back into that silence again feeling. There was stability there. Even though I missed the social dimension. But I could feel this onrush of energy that I couldn't control. And it was disturbing. And I didn't like it. And then the more practice got developed and the more that clear mind, that don't know, that moment mind, the more that became present in practice, first it starts in practice for a lot of us. There's some people who are just born trusting it. Practice. The more I started to prefer that to what came with socializing. So this is a very natural thing. It's a very natural thing. And there are reasons for it. There are reasons for it. We are designed as social creatures, human beings. We are social creatures. We have all of these softwares to navigate complex interaction in a social world. We have softwares for eating, for knowing what is good and what is bad from experience. It's constantly being updated. You know, we have it from birth, and then it's being updated by experience and by sickness and by what we get from the Internet and by friends. That's getting updated. We have softwares for dealing with, you know, how to look for, I don't know, a good bike or you know, to navigate our way through a city or what to do when we're alone. We have sorts of softwares for handling situations. And probably the most complex and maddening software and inside it, many softwares, is the software of how to navigate ourselves through a world of other human beings using their own softwares for navigating through the world. And it's a very complex bit of business, uses much more brain power, much more total thinking power than the softwares we use for deciding what to eat, deciding what kind of clothing to wear today, far more. So it's a very complex, intense software, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't very well. Yesterday we were trying in the Zen Center, it was Sunday, and we're doing every week this, uh, uh, this great uh, set of talks by Robert Thurman in New York that are being live streamed every Saturday night for a couple of weeks on the Vimalakirti Sutra. It's a great experience, just absolutely mind-blowing encounter with one of the great sutras of the Buddhist tradition. We're, 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 we're meeting the words of the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha, and it's just, wow, just makes you feel so honored again and, and lucky, <clears throat> blessed is the word to have encountered this teaching because it's just so crystal clear. <clears throat> and especially when it's being taught by a living bodhisattva like Robert Thurman. The thing is, some of our members, we're, we're trying to do it together with some of our members in Athens. So we want to watch the same moments of the lecture at the same time together of what he's saying and what he's covering. And then at certain points when he makes some statement or if there's something that I can tell is um, not being um, or is assuming a certain knowledge of things in Buddhism that I have not taught our members, 
I'll say stop. So we want to stop our video here in the Zen Center and the video in Athens at the same moment, and then I can clarify what is the background on that point. Or some of our members have a question, someone who's looking at it in Athens, or someone here in our family here in the Zen Center, um, has a question about what did he mean by that. So we stop at the same time, and then I do whatever I can to try to clarify that, and then, okay, are you at, okay, you're at, Five minutes and one second. Get the five minutes and one second. Okay, we're going to start at the same time. Because we want to have the same experience of material to review. So it's, okay, 501, right? 501, okay, good. Three, two, one, start. Boom! And we start at the same time and we can continue. And have this simultaneous experience. Well, we just decided yesterday, well, let's get some software. There's got to be a software where we can just, like, be watching the same thing at the same moment, and we don't have to be coordinating what second, stopping and starting, we can just have some master control over it. You should be able to do it. You can do anything with this stuff. We just walked around in the city outside and did a live stream two days ago. The place is all over. We were just testing equipment, but we're looking at the possibility of giving talks outside, so we want to see what the interface is with our devices and our gadgets and our software and our membership. And so we just took a walk out. You can do that. That was possible. Very realistic experience. So there should be able to be a way to do it. It was like a half hour, 35 minutes, trying to find, and we had a PhD computer science engineer. We had a certified hacker. We had a dude who went to film school doing editing. And then some jerk with a degree from Harvard and Yale showed up. We had to deal with him, too. So we had, the, we had three helpful people and someone around the edges making unhelpful commentary. We couldn't do it. 35 minutes, we're trying to find a way to just link a very simple thing. We're not trying to fly the space shuttle from Houston and Cape Canaveral in Florida. We're just trying to watch a video together on YouTube at the same time. By the way, if anyone has any idea, there's got to be an app out there that can help us do it. We just wanted to have this simultaneous lecture experience shareable. We couldn't do it after a while. It was so complex, such a simple thing, and all of these great minds there, we couldn't do it. The, the, the interface of the software could not be found. Couldn't be found. And our computer was getting stressed out and heating up, and we just said, forget, everything was freezing, and we, had to, we just said, forget about it. So it's the same thing. We, I have my social software, and then the person I meet has their social software. My social software operates by all of my, exper- my learning and my culture and my experiences and my learning and my practice and the emotions and the religions. It's all been updated, modified, crashed, informed, patched together with its own set of apps and downloads and coding. It's been coded through a certain set of experiences. And someone else's software. They got their base. We all have the same operating system as human beings. But then we've built onto this platform all of the other things that have happened in our lives since then. And hers and his and his and his and hers and hers and hers and his and hers and hers and his. They're basically, they're the same operating software, which is human being. We all hear that. That operating system is the same, but the add-ons, the build-ins, whatever a coder would say, has been coded differently. So now you're trying to get those softwares to interact, and we feel it you know, when we go to a party. That's why having a few drinks is helpful for a lot of people when they go into a party. Because you've got to go in, and there's all of these different softwares in a, you know, a, a, a cramped environment operating and interacting together. <clears throat> The jokes and the humor and the this and the, the pressure and this person's charisma and this person's weirdness and this person's originality and this person's a well-known artist and this person's a, a kind of a jerk that people kind of tolerate at these parties and this person is sleeping with that person's brother but you can't say it because it's a secret and if it comes out that'll be a problem for that relation. So you've got to be in these situations and your software, it's like our iMac right here that's recording all of this, it's okay to write emails. If I write an email, it's okay, it's no problem. But then when we've got to put this live stream software on and the and this sound software in there, and we've got YouTube Studio, and we've got Facebook Live, 
and we've got this iPhone, and we're recording on this iPhone, we've got two iPhones, the fan starts to become really loud after a while. This iMac, which is apparently, we were told when we ordered it, this wonderful donation from Jung Jinhua Bolsonin in London, thank you very much. It's a 5,000 euro iMac. Some good soul donated to us from London, because we don't have the money for doing this, to bring this free to anyone. You hook a few more interfaces up with it, this thing is suffering after a while. I heard that fan sound, and I thought, oh, it's just getting a little warm. No, Giannis told me, that thing is working. Then we checked inside. This iMac, which is supposed to be super capable, and it's going to be cutting edge, some expert told us, for the next five years, in terms of the kind of work we need to do in the Zen Center, is now we went into the guts of it, and we saw it's working at 98% capacity just doing this simple thing of running a live stream. The interface of all of these softwares is wearing it down, heating it up, and then that causes damage over time. If we did this all day, if we did this as a, a, a day-long seminar, this thing couldn't last a few weeks probably. So the same with us. How much more intricate is the software of human psychology? So we bring all these softwares, when we're with other people, these softwares automatically get engaged. They automatically come into play. And then the parts of our own software which are broken, which have bugs, malware that's been downloaded from a bad relationship. Viruses? Coronavirus? Coronavirus is fairly simple in one way. Wash your hands a lot, wear a mask, keep a little distance from people, you're good. Social viruses are far more insidious, and we download them all the time. They say if you're using a, if you're using a, a, a word, I don't know much about computers. My father was a computer executive, but I don't really have a lot of familiarity with computers. But I do know one simple thing that goes around the internet every now and then is if you go online with a computer, if you're using Apple, you won't get hacked so easily, you won't get viruses so easily, because the operating system occupies only a small percentage of computer users all over the world. But people using the Microsoft platform, within, what is it, within an hour, you have viruses entering your computer. Okay? So, as social beings, too, we're downloading lots of viruses, and especially when we interact with other people. Social viruses, not biological viruses, like a coronavirus. So it's very interesting that our letter writer says that, I've been practicing social, beautiful, beautiful letter, I've been practicing social distancing for most of my life. Beautiful letter. But when I interact with other people, I find it really super challenging. Yeah. And that's okay, too. There's nothing wrong with you. Jesus was the same way. He's like helping people, helping people, and then he like does some radical social distancing. He takes off into the mountains. Without warning, he takes off and the people pressed against him. And he saw their enormous excitement about him. He just, he's got to take off. He's got to get the hell away. He goes into the desert for 40 days. 40 days. Just takes off. So he's, he knows it. And then he comes back and he has more to offer people. Me too. Being a monk for me is, has been 20 something years of. 27 years of social distancing. I've done it very poorly, being a monk and being very active, trying to share the enthusiasm that you naturally feel for these teachings has gotten me where I'm back in the middle of social interactions. And so I find it very stressful to be doing it 
here in the city and in the middle of social relationships so intertwined. And so I get stress points that build up, especially if I'm busy and my practice is not engaged with consistency because of lots of travel and obligations to get this done for someone or to do that for someone. Or gets run down, like the iMac, like the 5,000 euro iMac. It gets run down. The fan starts spinning. Okay, so this is natural, and we know that if we don't take these breaks, we're lucky, people who practice are lucky, because you can take a break and you can see. And you can do retreat like this in your everyday life and you can see. You can return to your original factory setting. Don't know mind is the original factory setting before you were born. It's your true, original, clear mind. Okay, we're seeing now with this coronavirus situation, the air is cleaner. I'm getting all these pictures over China and over India and various cities, LA. There's a big set of pictures that came out. It's like how clean the air is. Animals returning, coming into the streets, that's another thing, but part of it. It returns to its original factory settings if you leave it alone. It's because we interfere and muck things up so much that we're damaging the operation of the ecosystem computer. Same with our psychology. So that's why we just have to practice. There's no way to figure it out. Your question is pointing to something, but if you're writing to me or you're engaged with the practice, you already know. So it's practice. Very simple. Doesn't require a lot of analysis. You just practice. And then you get stability in this don't know mind. In your clear, original operating system. Then you can handle these softwares a little bit more. In some ways you become more sensitive to them, more unable to handle them. That's a tricky thing to handle too. But please take faith that even someone like Jesus the most influential mind in, the, in Western civilization maybe in world history if you've got to put everyone together he had, to, he had to take off from it. So there's no shame in doing that. Sensitive, great minds need that. This computer, too, our 5,000 euro iMac, sometimes it's like the fan is going, okay, we've got to shut this baby off for a while. And then come back to the hard tasks of running a live stream and doing all the other things. So it's okay. It's a good thing that you re realize those limits. And you realize it's with other people. Like, look at this. If I look at the floor, my software doesn't engage with much. If I look at that cushion in front of me, my mental, intellectual software doesn't engage that much. But if I interact with people, laughing, what kind of thing? Was that joke enough? Oh, that was stupid. Oh, that person, did they look at me too much? Oh, I don't know. Do I seem angry today? Oh, that's because I, oh, maybe I should, oh, I'm a little tired. Oh, I shouldn't be here. Then our, our, we've got things operating on so many levels, and it's a lot of work for us. And as we become clearer and clearer and clearer about this vast, infinite space of don't know, we start to notice the difference between our original nature's natural functioning, hearing, smelling, seeing, tasting, perceiving, and the artificial, plasticky, constructed, thwarted, damaged, broken, bent, taped together, hung with piano wire, jammed up interactions that we need to become involved in just to function in this world, and especially those of us who live in cities, big cities like Athens, Kukaki, uh, present, then our computer is switching, noise, sound, and the, the, the 
constancy of some dog barking next door. And, wow, why don't they just put that part And then someone yelling upstairs, and you got this, and then someone, someone across the hall, or this problem, and then my girlfriend problems are, are calling me every day, and this, and you got this, and my mother needs me to visit. And then you've got this like hyper processing that's going on. And so just practice, keep a consistent practice. It's the only thing you can trust in. It's the only thing you can trust in. It's just returning to moment. Just returning to moment. Just returning to moment. And then the stability grows by itself. It's not going to fully eliminate that problem, but it does give you some clarity inside that even when that happens, that's not me. That's not me. So when you have that suffering and that confusion and that, ah, uh, oh, other people, uh, you, can, you can also let that thought go. It won't trap you that that's me. I have a problem. No, you don't have a problem. Your software has a little problem. But your computer is no problem. Your computer is originally complete, free and clear. It's just downloading and it's got a lot of viruses and it's got a lot of work that it's multitasking. So leave it alone. Don't ignore it. That's not what's being said here. Full awareness of it helps you know your limits. And then you learn, ah, I want to go to that party or something, but it's, it's a little bit late. That's not going to really help me. Oh, but they say you should be there if you're not there. Yeah, I know, but uh, then you start to make choices about what you're going to take into your practice in your life. So Jesus was like that, Buddha was like that, all practitioners are like that. There's no shame in that whatsoever. We're not designed, actually, by evolution. We're not designed to handle that much complex interaction that constantly for this long. Days and weeks in, in densely packed cities interacting like this. We are not designed by, interact, by evolution for that. So it's okay to feel a little bit of a crash and to take your time away. Okay? So I think that's uh, kind of giving the fullest picture for that sort of question of taking your original software and dealing with the complex functionings of densely packed life in a complicated modern world. Just practice. Return to your breath. Return to moment. Moment is, moment is the only reality. Moment is this infinite, unchanging, borderless you. the most important relation.